tardes. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Instituto Cervantes, uh, Leeds and Manchester. My name is Pedro Eusebio. I'm the director of these cultural centers of Cervantes in Northern England. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to inform you as a uh, new uh, possibility that this event uh, can be followed in, in, in English, but also in Spanish with the translation. And also, when you put your questions uh, in the chat, you can also ask in English or you prefer in, in Spanish as well. Well, today we have our first event of the in 2023 of our series on uh, bilingualism uh, with a lecture about uh, child interaction in the Spanish of English as a foreign language classroom, some findings from research. Uh, the lecture by uh, Dr. Maria del Pilar García Mayo, who is professor of English, of English philology at the University of the Basque Country, and who will be introduced uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Julio Villa García. Thank you very much to both of you for uh, having accepted the invitation for Instituto Cervantes. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you tonight. This series, as you might know, most, some of you, because as I said, is uh, the first of 2023 and also the first in our, our third year of this series, uh, has been designed uh, with the support and coordination of Dr. Uh, Julio Villa Garcia, who is senior lecturer at the University of Manchester, uh, whose field of research is focused in this subject. The main uh, objective of the series on bilingualism is to highlight the positive things that bilingualism has to offer. Research has shown that bilingualism is a benefit uh, for children's development and for the future. Children exposed to two or more languages from the very early age uh, become more aware of different cultures to the other points of view and Far from being a disadvantage, because there is also the debate, and this is also one of the aims of this series, that there is a debate whether it's beneficial or the challenges or the problems that can arise with bilingualism, especially uh, with children. But as I said, far from being a limitation of the process of the intellectual development of children, it is an enormous advantage. It makes uh, us more flexible, uh, aids the attention and concentration, and allow us, and above of all of these uh, advantages, uh, allow us the preservation of cultural diversity that enrich our society. Well, uh, as usual, I will introduce now Dr. Julio Villagarcia, the coordinator of the series, who is currently a senior lecturer in Spanish linguistics and syntax at the Department of Linguistics and English Language at the University of Manchester, and currently is Maria Zambrano, senior research at the, his, uh, his alma mater, sorry, the University of Oviedo in Asturias, in northern Spain. Dr. Uh, Villa Garcia, uh, in the course of his PhD at the University of Connecticut, was trained as a theoretical syntactician and as a language acquisitionist, working with the framework of minimalism. His current interest lie in the areas of Spanish Roman and English linguistics, and other interests include child language acquisition and the application of theoretical linguistic research to foreign second language pedagogy. So thank you again, Julio. Thank you, uh, Pilar. Uh, without further ado, I give the floor to, to Julio, and uh, I remind you again that you can follow the conversation in English or in Spanish, and also put the questions in both languages in the chat. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, my name is Julio, as, as Pedro uh, said, Julio Villa Garcia, and I am very lucky to be the coordinator of this um, series now in its third edition. So greetings from actually the Middle East. Today I'm in Doha in Qatar, where it's 9 p.m. So if I sound a bit cuckoo, please don't blame me. Uh, I currently belong to the Lingua Research Group at the University of Oviedo in Spain. And it is a real honor, a great honor, for me to introduce Professor Maria del Pilar García Mayo. She will be delivering the inaugural talk 
of the 2023 bilingualism series of the Instituto Cervantes of Manchester and Leeds. So we think that this is a very, very good start. And as I said, let me insist, this is now in its third edition. So we are really proud. Today, we're really lucky because we have with us one of the most prominent scholars, researchers in the realm of second and third language acquisition with a special emphasis on child English as a foreign language or child EFL. Professor García Mayo is a native of Galicia, the westernmost part of Spain and northernmost as well. And he was at the University of Santiago de Compostela where she undertook a BA in Anglo-Germanic studies. She then did an MA and a PhD at the University of Iowa in the United States. She has published published uh, dozens of peer-reviewed articles, two books. She has edited eight books. Uh, according, actually, to the prestigious Stanford ranking, she's among the world's 2% most cited scientists. So, you know, let me draw this comparison, uh, this analogy. If New York is the city that never sleeps, Maria del Pilar Cartia Mayo is very likely to be one of the linguists that barely sleeps, okay? <laughs> Actually, uh, Dr. Professor Pilar Garcia Ma Maria de Pilar Garcia Mayo's research focuses on the acquisition of the morphosyntax of um, English as an L2L3 from a Chomsky generative approach, as well as the analysis of oral interaction amongst learners of English as a foreign language from a cognitive, psycholinguistic, and sociocultural perspective. She has participated actually in a total of 23 competitive research projects and has actually been the PI, the principal investigator, in nine of them. She has also successfully supervised 15 PhD students. Currently, she serves as a head of department, okay, on top of all the teaching and all the research, she's the head of department. She also directs the MA in language acquisition in multilingual settings. Uh, it's a nice program in the Basque Country. And she's also the director of the Language and Speech Laboratory at the University of the Basque Country. In fact, for all her work, uh, Maria del Pilar García Mayo has been the recipient of several teaching and research awards, both in the United States and in Spain. In sum, if you look for what it means to be an academic in Wikipedia, I think Maria del Pilar García Mayo's picture should definitely show up, okay, the first hit. That's that's my, my, my take on it. Uh, so you're here to listen to her. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Maria del Pilar García Mayo. Many thanks. Okay, well, um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm going to, well, before sharing, actually, I'll like to thank both uh, Pedro and Julio, for that <laughs> wonderful introduction. Um, I do sleep, actually. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you, uh, hopefully sharing what uh, we have been doing all these years. So, so you can all see the title. Julio, I think, has already uh, mentioned it, Child Interaction in the Spanish EFL Classroom, some findings from uh, research. So the goal of my talk it's going to be threefold, uh, try to illustrate how young learners actively participate in their learning process, um, highlight the importance of teacher research or collaboration to improve foreign language learning with young learners, and to bridge the research practice gap in foreign language learning. Um, this is the outline I intend to follow. Um, I'll first talk a little bit about second language acquisition and the research practice gap then about communicating to learn EFL children and task-based language teaching. The core part will be some of the findings and pedagogical implications from our research. And then I'll conclude and provide some lines for further research. So what's the goal of research in the field of SLA? SLA, well, is the scientific discipline that studies the process through which humans acquire a language that is not their native language. And already back in 1973, Peter Corder stated that SLA research is about conveying the findings of linguistics, especially to language teachers, right? Now, you see uh, the cover of a book there by Ellis and Shintani, Exploring Language Pedagogy Through Second Language Acquisition Research, published in 2014. <clears throat> so although there are uh, some researchers who have, as they're starting, um, goal, you know, not SLA, but language pedagogy, 
The usual image of researchers and teachers is the one that I'll show in the next uh, slide. Uh, well, teachers are normally seen as, you know, people in action in the classroom. Uh, they're really practical. They have specific knowledge of a topic. And, uh, well, it's a craft. You know, being a teacher is a craft. Where researchers, you know, they're always, so most of the times, depicted as people wearing a white coat, uh, people that are always thinking very hard about topics. Uh, about theoret they have theoretical and abstract knowledge on those topics. And it's science. What they do is science versus craft, right? But um, there is actually you know, a lack of research use in policy making and practice. So researchers are seen as, as knowledge producers and practitioners are seen as knowledge recipients. And you know, dialogue between the two groups sh should be crucial for, for the benefit of both, right? I'm going to just mention here two um, uh, articles that were published some years ago about the effects, for example, of an introductory second language acquisition course on the belief of about three plus uh, 300 something uh, teach service teachers at the University of California. This is a paper that was published in 2010. And the teachers explained that they had dramatically changed their belief after taking the course, right? My colleague in the journal uh, we both edit, uh, Hussein Nasaji, also uh, uh, administered a questionnaire among 201 EFL teachers in Turkey and teachers, uh, ESL teachers in Canada. And most have taken training courses on SLA. Most believe that knowledge about SLA improved their teaching practice, but acknowledge that research articles were very difficult to understand and only 50% reported to have read research articles, no time, right? This is the experience we have uh, with our teachers and the people who have were already uh, teachers, but they, they take a break to um, uh, take a sabbatical or something to uh, take our, to follow our MA program, right? So we do need a change in perspective and to uh, carry out relevant research, right? Research that can help teachers, right? So how can we contribute to this? Well, in our case, what we have done is study an under-researched population, which is primary school children in a foreign language setting. Okay? Why? Well, because most governments uh, want their citizens to have a good command and of a language and compete in a more globalized world. And this is obviously supported by parents and legal caretakers nowadays, right? But the problem is that policymakers normally have generalized successful findings in immersion and L2 settings to foreign language contexts. And we know that teaching conditions in foreign language contexts are very different. There's a larger number of students, uh, there's limited curriculum time available, and sometimes there is lack of appropriate input. Yeah, let's face it. So, uh, you know, lowering of starting age, I mean, having children starting uh, the exposure to a foreign language early in life. Well, uh, there's a very nice quote by John Stone I always use, simply to assume that all will be well, just because the starting age has been lowered is a recipe for confusion, right? And we have done research both in the Basque Country and in Catalonia, with this idea in mind of the younger the better, well, we have shown in both uh, uh, settings that uh, when the linguistic outcomes are assessed in foreign language context, that young, the younger the better doesn't really work, right? Well, research has shown that children are highly successful learners when they have a lot of exposure to the new language over an extended period of time. Think of children in naturalistic setting, uh, child immigrants, for example, right? But the situation in classroom language learning is very different uh, because the amount of uh, language children are exposed to is also is limited. So it is in this situation that they seem to lag behind teenagers hmm, and all the learners. Now, we don't want to say that it is not a good idea to start early. It is a good idea because of different issues that I have listed here. Because children have an instinct for play, fun. They want to interact and talk. They develop positive attitudes towards the language. They develop language learning strategies. They show willingness to focus on communication rather than on accuracy. And recent research by uh, Victoria Murphy at Oxford and, and colleagues 
has shown that starting a foreign language early in life has a facilitative effect on L1 literacy, right? So the thing is that when you do research with uh, anything in, in second or foreign, uh, foreign language learning, you can approach it from many different perspectives. And in our research, we have adopted a task-based language teaching or rather a, a task-supported uh, language teaching approach because we believe that um, in low input settings like in foreign language settings, children have to be provided with as many language learning opportunities as possible. So we, what we do is we use tasks, tasks um, as, you know, because they focus on meaning, because there is always some kind of gap that uh, you need to convey information. We're gonna see some examples in the presentation. The learners have to rely on their linguistic and non-linguistic resources, and there is a clearly communicative outcome, okay? So uh, Rod Ellis and, and others, uh, Define TPLT as an approach to language teaching that prioritizes meaning but does not neglect form. Uh, it also gives a lot of importance of um, engaging learners' natural abilities for acquiring language, incidentally, as they use language as a meaning making tool. And the ultimate goal is for us researchers is to conduct empirical research with the potential for meaningful and positive impact on L2, in our case, for language classrooms. So when we started, you know, we realized that there was a clearly missing piece in the puzzle. We, uh, I mean, there was lots of research on ESL adults, on ESL children in other contexts, like uh, in Australia, right? We ourselves had carried out research on EFL adults, but where were the children, right? So um, according to, to Martin Bygate, when you do research within uh, TBLT, you can adopt two, I'm gonna put the whole thing here, right? And one part of it I cannot see because of this uh, issue that I have here anyway. Okay, so you can carry out research from a cognitive psycholinguistic perspective or from a social cultural perspective. And you will see, you'll focus on different issues in each of them. If you look at the cognitive side, you will look at the relationship between the tasks the, the children carry out and the incidence of negotiation of meaning the impact of past features on effective language use and language processing. Whereas if you do it from a social cultural perspective, you are interested in seeing how learners help each other, how learners collaborate and how, I mean, the patterns that are established in that collaboration. And I also have there, I hope you can see it because I cannot, um, L1 use, because um, until very recently, learners in foreign language settings, they shared an L1 or two L1s, right? But nowadays, obviously, we cannot maintain that anymore because there are lots of people from many different parts of the world, especially here in the Basque country, okay? So anyway, these two uh, perspectives can inform TBLT. And before I go into the actual uh, data that we have from our learners, I need to, to very briefly introduce some concepts, right? One is the interaction hypothesis, which claims that when you interact, when you're learning a language, then uh, that has a very positive role in your process of L2 acquisition because you are provided with positive input. You are provided also from corrective feedback by your peers or by the teacher, and that will force you to, in a way, modify the, what you produce, your output, and make it more comprehensible, okay? And there is one type of uh, interaction, which is negotiation of meaning, which is just one in particular type. And what it does is, you know, it's like the type of conversation routines that uh, are modified in order, in order to overcome communication breakdowns. And this is a sign that learners are really engaged in what they are doing, okay? I also want to mention collaborative dialogue because uh, this is a form of, of output of production that allows learners to notice a gap between their interlanguage and the target language, that is between what they know and what the target language, uh, uh, I mean, what the target language is about. And then this word languaging, which Meryl Swain coined some years ago, which is uh, referring to the crucial source of learning because learners make meaning of their interaction and also shape their knowledge and experience. Um, I have used this image because what they do is they co-construct meaning, right? So they construct meaning together. Right? And they also pay attention to form without the teacher intervention, as we will see in examples. Okay. 
So in the past country, uh, we have a sustained research uh, um, project, I mean, research um, yeah, program, right? Which um, has provided us with a wealth of empirical data and research findings, which have been acknowledged internationally. So there is a series of like books and special issues that we have been uh, publishing throughout the years. And um, I need to mention here, of course, because we have to acknowledge the, 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 the grants from the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Competitiveness. So the data I'll be showing here come from those two projects that you see on the screen. And in those projects, we collected both cross-sectional and longitudinal data, both in Victoria Gasteiz, which is the capital of the Basque Country, and in Pamplona, in Navarre, a neighboring uh, region. The age range is the Spanish uh, primary school range, six to 12. We used oral and oral plus written tasks, so we'll see some. And the major characteristics of our learners are that they're all beginner learners, but not because the teachers say so, or because we say so, or because we believe they're beginners because they're young. No, because we give them standardized tests. We have a very large sample. Uh, I'm sure that nowadays it's more than 500 children. And uh, another characteristic is that we have teacher research or collaboration in the way in the tasks we implement in the classroom. Okay? So I'm going to put uh, just those things here. I mean, these are some of the issues that, have, that we have um, considered in our research, our news, negotiation strategies, feedback, all of those things, right? But in today's presentation, I just I'm going to highlight 10 issues that we have learned from all this uh, research, yeah? What I'll be doing is I'll provide the main ideas, reference to the article or the chapter where those ideas appear, data illustrating the topics, and uh, of course, what I wanna say here is that feel free to email me if you want the whole article or the whole chapter, okay? Because I'm gonna go through different stories here and uh, I might go a bit fast or something and I won't be, I really want you to, to, you know, I want to share with you what we have done. So the first, Take home message will be that EFL primary school children successfully negotiate for meaning in task supported interaction. Okay, I leave those uh, references there, but I'm interested in showing you what we did have in our first study, the first that was published in the first um, project. We had 80 children in fifth year and third year primary and fifth year primary, and they had to complete this board that you had here. That you have here, each of them have the same board, right? And as you see, there are two parts there: a classroom and a, and a playground. And the goal was that they sh they should manage to have uh, the pictures that I'm going to show you in the very same positions, right? So these are photos actually of children that they knew, right? And they had to have them in the very same positions, right? So I'm going to show you this uh, uh this uh I don't know icon here or some or whatever, it's a video camera just to show you the many hours that we have to, you know, data that we have collected. And obviously those data have to be transcribed and codified. And we codify the different strategies that the children use. What did they use? Well, they use, for example, comprehension checks, right? Uh, by the way, everything that is in the PowerPoint is verbatim. I mean, it's like the children say, said it, okay? So in the class, I have a children, it's a boy with a t-shirt, black, have the hair like brown in her t-shirt, put six and it's in the blackboard, you know? Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> so that's a comprehension check. Not very common because at this age, they do not really care about their partner's feelings, right? But from time to time, you see one of those. They also use clarification requests, right? So where do you have the girl? What? Where do you have the girl? So I haven't understood you. Could you please clarify, right? Or um, these are the ones here. Uh, where, where the girl who is eating the sandwich can be? I have her in front of the door. Of the door? I mean, are you sure it is the door, right? Yes, yeah. So these types of things. That was the first message. They do negotiate for me. Okay? They use the same strategies that ESL children use. EFL primary school children negotiate more. And this is very interesting. I think the younger they are, and they use fewer and and and, and the younger they are, and all the learners, I mean all the learners in the sense of in the primary school period, use fewer conversational judgments and make more use of their shared L1, right? 
So we also see, we have also seen that there are age differences among, I mean, the type of strategies they use, right? So in this study, we had eight to nine year olds and 10 to 11 year olds. And the younger ones negotiated mostly to repair communication breakdowns, where the older ones, they showed a greater concern about their interlocutor's needs. So in this, um, in this uh, that, that study, which was actually coming out from a, a PhD thesis, my PhD student, Maria Angeles Hidalgo, came up with that um, kind of uh, those different flights upstairs you have there. So like four stages yeah, in primary school, when they are very little, they just basically ignore communication breakdowns and there is very little negotiation of them. In the other three stages, what you see is that they negotiate to repair those communication breakdowns, but they use different uh, conversational routines. Oh, sorry, they use different conversational attachments, clarification requests, confirmation checks, or acknowledgments. In the last three stages, they use all of them, okay, but I've just put there the ones that are more common in each of the stages, right? I also want to highlight the fact that context is, um, I mean, is uh, as a meaning, um, context plays a role, okay, in uh, as a mediating factor in, um, in, the, in the in interaction. So in this, the first study that I mentioned, what we did was we compare CLIL and EFL learners. I'm assuming CLIL here, okay, CLIL is content and language integrating learning. And uh, the idea is that they have more hours of exposure to the language per week, right? So uh, we compare uh, people, I mean, children, sorry, of the same um, age, but in different, uh, in different uh, teaching programs. And then uh, what we find, and then people in the same teaching program in different ages, right? So in the first group, well, we found that both groups negotiated for meaning with age and proficiency match peers. But in the ones that were of the same age in different programs, what we found was that the ones that had more exposure to the language, they significantly doubled the number of conversational attachments and made less use of their first language, right? We thought, okay, well, then it is, it's the context, right? Because they, are, they have more exposure, they, they, they use more conversational attachments. Okay, with the other ones, uh, the ones in the same setting, but with different ages, as I've just mentioned, the younger learners negotiated more, right? Now, I want to mention here that we were very lucky and we could gather data from the very same children, but one year later, right? The third year primary one, they are now in fourth year primary and the fifth year primary is sixth year primary. And guess what? Well, we had again more or less nine hours of recording, and this were the this is the summary of it. Younger learners negotiated more, so this this should give us an idea that the, the earlier you start with this type of task that engages learners, the better. But context now is not the clear learners. Now, one year later, clear learners probably because they were more used to participating in classroom interaction. Now they were less likely to use conversational attachments. I just mentioned this study here because just to highlight how important longitudinal studies are, because these are the same children, but one year later, okay? So I wish we could have access to classrooms and could follow, you know, wish we could follow children longitudinally for our studies. As I will say at the end, it's not the case. Now I want to move on to task repetition, which we have found that it really increases collaborative patterns, right? So I want to mention that task repetition is a really favorable context for language learning because the first time you carry out a task, you go for meaning. I mean, you just wanna know what is going on in the task. But if you give the children the very same task, one week later or two days later, they are really more likely to focus on, on formal aspects of the language, right? I'm probably going to say this very quickly because I'm just interested in the blue parts that you see there. Naomi Storch, uh, uh, 20 years or more than 20 years ago, came up with four types of collaborative patterns that were established when children speak. And she uh, found that only the ones that you have in blue there when they are collaborative or when you have one expert novice pair, 
they are really, uh, you know, they, they do pay attention to language form and they retain the linguistic knowledge that, that they co-construct, okay? So, of course, when we do our studies, we have to measure the children's interaction and we use this measure uh, that was um, defined by Swain and Lapkin many years ago, uh, language-related episodes, which is um, dialogue where learners talk about the language they are producing, question their language use, or correct themselves or others. And these LREs are incidental. They are determined by learner needs, right? Because they only ask about what they don't know about, but they have been claimed to be learning in action. So I want to show you this study that we did with 120 children, right, of different uh, two different ages, age groups, and we had at the first at the first time time one they did a spot the difference task, right? Each member of the pair had a different cowboy, right, and they had to spot the difference, right? At time two, some of them did the very same task, but others did what we know as procedural task repetition which is exactly the same type of task, so spot the difference, but with a different content. It's a different thought, a different picture, right? And the third group did some other, some other task, right? So here we had a lot of hours of interaction, right? And what we found was that the younger ones fitted mostly in the collaborative pattern, and the older ones, just one year later, they fitted in a pattern that was later identified with Chinese EFL learners of this very same age, passive parallel. I'm going to show you two examples, okay? The little one, uh, nine dyads produce uh, LREs. In these ones, they were totally absent, okay? So look at a collaborative pattern, okay? It's visually very different from the one I'm going to show you next. In a collaborative pattern, you see clarification requests, right? Of course, there is L1 use, but the children move the task along, right? The, the, they, they keep asking questions. Look at this one, yeah, and see the, the contrast. Just question, no, question, yes, so and so forth. Kind of really boring to translate, uh, to transcribe, by the way. So what did we find about uh, uh, procedural task repetition? <coughs> Sorry. It not only um, led to more focus on form, but task repetition also decreased L1 use, right? So in this study, uh, we found that, well, in general, they did not make an excessive use of their L1, that both procedural and same task repetition decreased L1 use, I've just said. And now I'm going to show you some examples with the functions for which what the L1 was used were the same, right? Basically to avoid communication breakdowns, and to move the task along, okay? And as this is a bilingual talk, uh, okay, so they, they, they're completing a task and one says cupboard, just that, right? It's done, so let's move on. Yeah? And they use Spanish for that. The boy is, um, cambio de pregunta. I'll change the question because probably the, the child did not know how to go on. And so cambio de pregunta and uses Spanish for that, right? The girl is opposite the flowers. Yeah. Ah, me toca a mí, it's my turn, right? and they go on. Also, procedural task repetition increases attention to language form, right? And here, what we had was a collaborative writing task. This was just like that. The children saw visual input, like the one you see there, very simple, five cartoons, uh, colorful situations they are familiar with. And they did it three times, but one group did the very same uh, uh, cartoon three times, and another group did three different cartoons, but they were of the same characteristics, okay? And then they had to write a text. What we found was that they focused more on form than on meaning, and with exact time repetition, there were fewer language-related episodes. With procedural task repetition, there were more. And LREs, were not really target light resolved, or they were fewer target light resolved salaries with exact task repetition, where with procedural task repetition, there were more target light resolved. And uh, you know, the collaborative writing tasks combined the benefits of both oral and written tasks because the learners really interacted, they focus on the form of the message and co-constructed knowledge. Okay. Um, 
sorry, this is the influence of being working with children for such a long time. So you have an example here of a formula that we correctly solved. The child says he's sad because he's looking at her at his phone. So self-correction, right? Later, Robert go. goes with S, goes. Yeah, I know. And this course, lo he puesto así, más corto. Ah, I've, I've written it this way, you know, shorter, right? So issues that have to do with um, how they organize these course. I want to mention this one, although I think I have like 10 minutes left, I guess, task modality. Because task modality is a topic that is really very interesting and is, uh, research is being done these days on it. So you can use tasks that, especially oral tasks, um, in oral tasks, learners focus their attention on meaning basically, but if you include, uh, you ask them to write a text, then they, uh, they are more likely to focus on, on the form of the language. And there is also this issue of pair formation, which was looked at by Mosafari with adults, and the idea is that if you pair someone with a friend, then that person is going to have more off-task talk. They will be talking about other things, but not about the task. Whereas if the researcher or the teacher pairs the learners, then they are more likely to focus on, on the language, right? So I want to show you here, I'm just interested in your seeing the, the, the material we created, right? So we have different learners, different pairs, researcher assigned or teacher assigned or self-assigned. And for the oral task, they had to agree on, on the order of a story, of a detective story, because they were working with detectives in the classroom, right? So we, we decided that that would be a good idea. And for the oral class written, it was also a detective story. And they were given some clues, and they had to decide, right, who made a mess in the laboratory, right? And we gave them like several characters and we get description, you know, their, how, how tall or how short they were, uh, their fingerprints and all that. And what we found was that they were all very collaborative. And see, this is very important. Okay, look at that. This is the title. So we have to see what is a problem. So it's, it doesn't say, I mean, child B doesn't say you have to see or I have to see. No, we have to see. They use clarification requests, they use comprehension checks, and they both collaborate, right? So what we found was that these learners generated more LREs in the oral class written task, and the pair formation method also had an impact because the ones that were more productive were the ones that were assigned by the researcher, then followed by the ones assigned by the teacher and the self-selected. And at least 50% of those LRE were correctly resolved by the children themselves, right? And um, researcher assigned pairs or dyads were also more, I mean, they, they, they participated more and they used the L2 more as well, right? I also want to mention this uh, task that we have used a lot, which is dictogloss. And I'll probably skip this part because um, I think I probably I think I have to finish it by five to eight, right? I think I don't know, but I don't want to. Okay, so a dictogloss is a very very convenient task and a very popular task. The first time the children or the participants send the participants because you can adjust it to the proficiency level of whatever participant. They just listen to a story. The second time they listen and take down keywords, they jot down keywords, and the first step is that they, in pairs, they put together the text, right? And so there is always a, a hidden part that the researchers are interested in. In our case, it was the S of the third person singular in English, right? So in this study, what we found was that the learners really focused on formal aspects of the language, but not necessarily on the one that we were interested in, and most salaries were correctly resolved, okay? So you have an example here. We were talking about a Chinese girl. She sees, she sees, no, she sees. She sees her parents twice a year, twice twice a week, or a year. She sees, she sees, no, she sees, no. Yin sees, okay? So third person there. This one is good. For the recipe, she buys, she buys. Te falta una S, you're missing an S. She buys sweets. So there is no teacher intervention here, you see? It's just the learners, right? And the same with his, her, which is another hobby horse of, of, of the children. 
A ver, let's see. María give to her. His, her, she, her. Ah, es chica, es chica. Y María, sí, sí. María gives to her grandma. Okay. And um, I want to mention this very quickly because this has to do with the written production, right? And this is just from a dissertation just defended uh, in December. Um, and um, what they did, I mean, you see the visual input here, very similar to what we used earlier. As you see, they're all taken from Cambridge English and other, and other books. And this is um, obviously uh, oversimplified here, but there were just 60 children. They had to uh, discuss what was going on in the, in the, in the vignettes, in the cartoons, and they had to write. Then the in the next section, they were provided with a model written by the native speaker of the language. And they had to compare and discuss what the difference is between what they did and what the, the model provided them with. Then they had to rewrite it and all that. Anyway, in the short term, what we found, in, this was a longitudinal study throughout the whole semester, okay? So the models led the children to reduce the number of basic clauses, increase the grammatical complexity of their text. And in the long term, that is to say, after the whole semester, they were able to produce more clauses, to have a greater lexical diversity, to make few mistakes, and to improve coherence and cohesion. Okay. So, of course, uh, you know, research alone, we are totally aware that research alone does not change practice, and we need to be aware of that. We wish, you know, we wish it did change practice. So, what I've done there is just, I'm not going to go through that because, as I said, you know, you can listen to, uh, to the talk again in more detail in, in when it, because it is being recorded. So I've put there you know, the, major, the major findings of all these years of, of research. We believe you know, that we have, um, we can, uh, obviously we share these with the schools that collaborate with us and, uh, and we believe they, they might have an impact in their, in their everyday uh, teaching, right? But um, as I always like to look ahead, I just want to highlight here for you uh, uh, parts of um, issues that need a lot of research. One is teacher research or collaboration. The other is effective grammar pedagogy for young learners. And the other is individual learner differences. So just to summarize for you, we need, and we can talk about this in, in the question and, act and answer uh, period, we have a lot of problem access in schools. Of course, uh, this need for teacher training because preparation of these lessons is not easy. And it has to be, you know, this, I mean, there has to be institutionalization of innovation. This needs to be guaranteed, right? And of course, we have to be very careful with ethical issues and methodological issues, right? So ethical issues um, that have to do with informed consent, right? I have mentioned that. But every time we go before going into the classroom, we have to get informed consent by the parents or legal caretakers and by the headmasters of the school, right? And um, in that chapter that I put there, I, I entitled it with, um, are you coming back? It was fun, right? This was something that the children told us when we were leaving um, the school one day. And then of course, lots of methodological issues, right? Uh, methodological issues designing our own material, right? So what you have there is from another dissertation and you see the, the, the snake there, which is supposed to be, the, I mean, to highlight the importance of the S, right? So lots of material that we have to, to design. Effective grammar pedagogy for young learners, you know, working with corrective feedback models and reformulations, making children aware of what their own learning, I mean, making them aware of their own learning teach them how to collaborate effectively, right? And the oral written connection, to what extent what they do in, in the oral mode transfers to the written mode, right? And I'll, I'm not gonna go over this, this is just for you to know that we currently have uh, another project, yeah? From the, from the ministry, and um, this is now the Ministry of Science and Innovation, okay? So the project is, is ongoing and we hope to find um, to get results soon, right? And individual learner differences, well, I have mentioned some there, attitudes, motivation, peer dynamics, and metalinguistic awareness. All those individual differences have an impact on how children use the language, and we have to consider those two, right? So, of course, uh, thanks very much. I am aware that, muchísimas gracias. I'm aware that I've probably 
I've gone too fast in some of the slides, but I'm more than happy to, you know, um, ask, answer your the questions you may have. And of course, I'm always available. You know, um, you send me a message, I can send you the material and anything we have written about, uh, uh, you know, the data that the children have provided us with, which we believe that is more and more exciting as we as we go along, right? So much to do and so little time, right? Thank you for this wonderful talk, Professor Garcia Mayo. Very inspirational. As you say, a lot of food for thought, little time in our hands. So I'm looking forward to the discussion that ensues from your talk. Um, so if anybody would like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand and mute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was not looking at the chat. Sorry for the all oh, the interruption. Oh, no worries. No, no worries. So I think some people have their camera on, which makes me uh, assume they are going to ask a question. Otherwise, you can write it on the chat and I'll be very happy to read it out loud or to uh, paraphrase it for our guest speaker. I, I, do I see the chat? Uh, I would like just to, to set an idea and maybe a question also. There is always the debate that when the children they start too early to learn a foreign mm -hmm. language, it might get, uh, lead to a certain confusion when you don't manage your mother tongue to mm -hmm. learn a foreign language, even with all this cooperation that is very clear after your fantastic uh, talk. Uh, what can you say about it? Because from the, the, the talk, the, 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 it has been very uh, well structured on the, the analysis, scientific analysis, the sooner the best. Mm, okay, so the idea here is that we are talking about children that start learning of the language. I mean, some of them early because uh, they can start at age three, but I mean, primary school, six, right? So uh, the idea is that you may be learning the language in a mainstream English program here in Spain, so like three, four hours per week, right? But there are other children that learn that have like more um, information about them. I mean, they have more hours of exposure if they are in a content and language integrated program. They made up having seven or eight hours. It all depends on the school, right? So what we found with our uh, research um, with EFL children many years ago, yeah, because the, the edited book was published back in, in 2000, 2000, 2003 and the one in Catalonia in 2006, was that this idea of the earlier the better in a foreign language setting with just three hours of exposure per week. It was, I mean, how can I say this without being, uh, sin, que, sin que me malinterpreten los periodistas que nos hacían, que nos hacían eh, entrevistas. No estoy, I'm not saying that it is bad to start early, right? It's always great if you have good input and plenty of input, right? But if you have little input and sometimes not very good quality input, then you might as well start when you are 11 and 12, which by the way, was the time, the age period at which those people in my generation started our first exposure to a foreign language, which in my case was French, right? So it's always great to start soon if you have good quality input and you have plenty of input, okay? And this is the end, the end of the story for, and this was the end result of both our project here in the Basque Country and in Catalonia, right? So this is, but again, I'm talking about school children. I'm not talking about learning languages in naturalistic settings, right? Excellent. Any difference in evidence within one? Yeah. Are, are there any differences in terms of the evidence available when uh -huh. it comes to monolingual versus multilingual contexts? For, so for uh -huh. instance, in Basque Country, which is yeah. a bilingual region versus other yeah. regions where there are no um, yeah, second. Yeah. So the idea is that, I mean, the, what I can talk about in this in this presentation is I'm only limiting myself to the data we have collected on this topic, I mean, interaction, right, in the classroom. So I, I don't like to say this, but probably our group is, is, is the group that, that I, together with some people in Catalonia, Elizabeth Ladeval does this type of research too, but there is, I mean, Catalonia is also a bilingual community, right? So our children already have Basque and Spanish, and then they are learning English. Now, here, what I have to say is that, and this is connected to access to schools, right? 
I'm really sorry to say that, you know, we don't have access to public schools, right? When, again, as I said at the end, this should be part of an institutionalized program in which, you know, researchers go to do research, obviously, but then to transfer and convey all, all those results in everyday words to teachers, right? But so far in all these years, and as you have seen the project, the first project we had started in 2012, we have only collaborated with semi-private schools, concertados, colegios concertados, right? Mm -hmm. They, they in general, you know, they, they are very nice to us. They provide us with, because it's not just to go there. They have to provide us with spaces. They have to interrupt their, their everyday rhythm in the classroom to, you know, to make room for these researchers and all that. So our data are obviously biased in the sense of, for example, Vitoria Gasteiz within the Basque country, you know, it's not the typical Basque city, right? I mean, it's like, it will be, I guess the data would be very different if they had been collected in San Sebastián, right? But in the Basque country, in Vitoria Gasteiz, probably Vitoria Gasteiz is the capital city. Well, I don't know, I'll have to compare with Bilbao, but you don't really listen to Basque in, in, in the streets. They do have Basque in the classroom, but very interestingly, interest, interestingly, when they fall back on their first language, as you have seen in the examples, they, we, I mean, I, I can't remember any, any example with Basque, yeah? Using, for example, those, those, those examples I have shown that es mi, es mi turno, pues ahora cambio de pregunta. They use Spanish all the time. So, you know, that, that's such an interesting idea to compare with other regions that are monolingual, but we don't have data to be compared with. And uh, I, I wonder to what extent in this case, Basque is the language that they use when they, when they want to move the task along, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's a question, uh, a very interesting yeah. question. How about do you see how generative? You yeah, generative yeah. artificial intelligence, the book, oh. uh, if, whether it could play a role in e English oh, or foreign language wow. at all. Wow. I mean, it's like, I don't want to get into that because I have no clue about artificial intelligence. But I'm, I'm so, actually, just before the presentation, I was talking to a colleague and we are so worried about the type of students we are getting at the university level. And this has to do with what they do in primary and, and high school. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually so worried about technology being, I mean, for me, it's, of course, it's a, it's a tool that you have to use, but don't overuse it. You know, it's much nicer to have people using the language with tasks that, you know, of course, from your perspective as an adult, those tasks could be kind of, I don't know, boring or something, but for them, you know, they're colorful photos and they, they, I mean, like the detective stories, for example, were really popular, right? Because they were working with detective stories in the classroom and, you know, just for them to find out who was the one that made the mess in the lab, I thought, I thought that, I mean, transcribing those data was really hilarious because, you know, some of them say, well, you know, this one looks very nice, but, ah, you know, probably she has other plans and they were, and you know what? The teachers themselves, sometimes when you show them the interaction, because obviously we have to transcribe everything and codify and all that, and you show them and they go like, huh, como? Fulanito, pero si no abre la boca en clase. I mean, this guy doesn't, you know, never opens his or her mouth. And now look at him or her. So, you know, right. um, and, and I have to say that, you know, I think I always say, you know, if I win the lottery, you know, I'll just create like a, you know, something so that, you know, they could allow us to gather data because that, that, that will be very, that will be so beneficial for schools. And these, uh, my idea is that these should be done large scale, right? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, otherwise, um, you know, what's the point, right? I'm uh, actually thinking in light of, of, of this very interesting question about this chat box or whatever it's called, the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm creature uh, and this is just a general comment it's not a question as such maybe somebody or you yourself Maria del Pilar can can um, enlighten the discussion here but yeah I'm thinking that maybe you know for compositions if you have to write a composition on I don't know traveling around Europe and you ask mm -hmm. the chat box to write 300 words on that it will do it within seconds right mm -hmm. and most likely the English will be immaculate so mm -hmm. I guess there are issues of plagiarism or or well authorship rather than plagiarism mm -hmm. here uh, and and the question in my mind arises as to whether 
is this worse than than just writing it in Spanish and, and using a, a machine translator? Well, at least the machine translator, it means that you wrote it in Spanish, at least you wrote something in Spanish. <laughs> No worries. I'm looking at the chat, Julio, because there is yeah, a very yeah. long thing here. Uh, no, I will um I will read it out loud. Um uh, oh, okay, okay. this will be recorded for the future. But anyway, I was just thinking about that. Um yeah. well, I was thinking about that. For me, for me, that's a much like like I don't know. That's a topic that is such I mean encompasses so many issues and it has to do with the whole education system. And so I'd rather not give my opinion about that because Absolutely. I'll be criticizing everything from bottom right, to right. top, you know? I'm old enough to have known other systems and I think that right, right. we are not going in the right direction, I think. Right. Just uh, just just judging on the basis of the type of, of students we are getting at the university level. I mean, the, 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 it's just terrible, mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah. Actually, so, Actually, so listen to this one. It's an interesting one. Uh, well, they thank you for this very interesting and insightful talk. And uh, this person is extremely interested in how to make better use of pedagogical implications and putting those into practice. More specifically, they have a practical question. Before starting studies with primary learners, do researchers collaborate with school mm -hmm. teachers to make teaching plans? Or alternatively, do research make the plans and let the school teachers implement? Okay, great. That's a great question, actually, because this is actually what my whole goal is. You know, the ideal world should be that, well, in fact, there is a person that um, is not with us anymore, but she was the one that inspired me to start all this line of, of research on interaction, which is uh, was uh, Teresa Pica from the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, in, in Pennsylvania, they had a center, which was like a think tank, right? And so you had researchers and teachers together. They would meet, I don't know, once a week or once uh, every two weeks or something. And so the researchers on the basis of, you know, whatever theories, whatever right, ideas, they would design a task, right? And then they will give the task to the teachers to implement in the classroom. And uh, the teachers would come back and say, okay, this, were, this worked great, or it was, it was una basura, right? It did not work. And so there was like a whole cycle, you know, of uh, implementation, feedback again, and all that. Okay, that's my, my dream, you know? But that's, again, I repeat, it's kind of impossible in our setting. I know in our setting, in other parts of Spain as well, because of the, you know, as I said, the public system, right? in the public system, you don't always have the very same teachers, right? There's lots of substitutes. And so they cannot, um, you know, they cannot say, well, yes, of course, I agree to that. Well, plus they have to have the permission of, I mean, I, I always, so how do I do it? Or how do we do it? We have, um, you know, like in our current uh, uh, project, like two years before the, the call for the project is out, no, well, we start thinking, okay, what's this the topic I want to go on, blah, 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 with it. So I prepare the proposal, and with that proposal, before, before the proposal is even granted, I go to schools that collaborate with us and talk to the headmaster. Of course, now we know some of them. And so, okay, here we are again, las gente pesada de, de la universidad. Okay, so they know us, and what we do is um, once the, the, I mean, this is the topic we want to work on, what do you think, blah, blah, blah. And so we exchange ideas with them. And then when the actual grant, I mean, when the actual project is granted, then we go again. And like in the present project, we have four studies, right? So for each study, we go and we go with a scale, I mean, with a timeline. Okay, do you agree with this timeline? How do you see it? So for example, in the first study, we thought that we could do it longitudinally for eight weeks or something, and we had to reduce it to six because, of course, we had to adjust to their schedule. Si es el día del árbol, es el día del árbol. Si, si they go on a trip somewhere, so, you know, so you have to interrupt data gathering. So we have to reschedule the whole thing. Anyway, so that's how we work, right? And then, of course, what we do is once the project is done, we share with them the results. But in teacher seminar, I mean, in teacher seminars in which we obviously forget about all the statistics and all that that appear in the in the published papers, we convey the material in you know very in words that everyone can understand. Okay, what do you, for example with dictogloss, la dictoglossia, they didn't even know that it existed, right? Because of course, in my times we did dictations, but what about if you add this new idea of 
you know, let them listen. Then the second time they listen and they write down some words. And then they together, they put the text together, right? And, and you record all that. And it's very interesting and it's interesting for the teachers too, right? But of course, we, I mean, you have to be very aware that teachers, even in primary school, they, are, they have to follow a program, right? And you cannot, you know, interrupt, uh, you know, their, 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 their daily work by, you know, uh, collecting data all, all, I mean, all the time you want. So I think that, I mean, you know, from our humble point of view, I think that we have contributed a bit, but that's just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. There is so much to be done, right? And um, for example, this, this, this last study that I mentioned, which was from a thesis just, uh, well, defended in December, um, this was a longitudinal study. You know what it is for a school to have a group of learners receiving models, you know, and, 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 and video, I mean, to have someone videotaping the children, well, not just one person, several people helping the, the PhD student, you know, throughout, I mean, from June, from January to June or to May, basically. I mean, the amount of data collected, you know, collected was just amazing. But see, but the end result was that, look, just using models, because obviously we have three groups, one with uh, which had models throughout the semester, another one that had a model at the beginning and another one at the end, and another one which did not have models. And you know, you could see that just with one semester, how much they could improve, right? So that's something that teachers can use. I mean, just give them visual input with stories. They write those stories. They provide them. The teacher can provide a model, have them discuss, and the teacher doesn't have to record them. So, you know, and, and they learn from that. So they appreciate that type of task. And, uh, and we feel happy with that too. Very nice. Oh, there's, a last, there's a last comment here in Spanish. I will mm -hmm. uh, translate it into English. Uh, uh, implementing, implementing the lessons with the help and the support of researchers would be ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, this is due to the fact that many times, even though teachers uh, like us read uh, research papers, articles, mm -hmm. right? We don't really know how to put mm -hmm. all of that into practice. So mm -hmm. what you're proposing, more training in that sense, and this being offered by schools could be wonderful. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. all these ideas are necessary. Thank you very much. So it's basically a comment rather than a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I really appreciate Wonderful that. Part. And again, as, as you said in the introduction, a very nice introduction, I'm also, the, I'm also responsible for the master's program, master's in language acquisition and multilingual settings. So in our very first cohort back in 2009, we had two teachers, one was a primary school teacher, another one a high school teacher. And I still remember, because my course is uh, the acquisition of morphosyntax, right? I still remember the time when I explained, I mean, you take things from, for granted as a researcher, when I explained uh, the morpheme studies, right? And uh, they were like, I mean, it was like, I don't know, because I'm, I'm old enough to remember Vicky el Vikingo, which was una serie de dibujos animados que teníamos en España. Y cuando Vicky el Vikingo eh, tenía una idea, hacía así, ¿no? Eureka y tal. And so you could see that Eureka type of expression, like, oh, that's why the S is so difficult for my learners. It's not that my learners are stupid, right? It's that it is a difficult morphine for several reasons that we don't want to get into, right? But just, and that's, what I said at the very beginning, you know, teachers always say we need more training, right? And that's why I'm saying that this is something that universities, I mean, you know, here I have a large research group, which is, which is really very well funded by the BAS government. And we are very lucky and we are always grateful for that. But how much of that research that we have been doing throughout the years has actually reached the classrooms? Very little very little. So there is like a, a mismatch between what is invested in research and what gets to society, right? And that's the gap that I'm really worried about. Because really, we don't want to, we do want to convey all that uh, information, right? Yeah. So thanks for the comment, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's always, uh, I'm just thinking out loud, right? But 
Uh, there's always this issue with, you know, I'm really concerned with with making linguistics accessible, right, to, mm -hmm. to the lay person and in general. For instance, I'm here at a translation conference in, in Doha, and, and you see many of the concepts, you know, they come after your talk and ask you, right, about hierarchy, syntax, mm -hmm. preposition, even prepositional phrase, and these mm -hmm. are translated. I'm not, I'm not uh, undermining their work or their knowledge. They are all mm -hmm. super professional, but they they seem to people seem to distance the, themselves from the theoretical aspect, right? Mm -hmm. I was talking to a colleague at the university who you know in Oviedo, mm -hmm. Dr. Francisco Martin Miguel, and he was saying mm -hmm. that sometimes I cannot go below level of, for instance, die transitive, which is basically a verb that takes two complements, like I gave him a dog, mm -hmm. right? I gave a dog to him. Uh, and sometimes you you cannot simplify things even further, but there's always that balance, right? We need to yeah, yeah. really make it accessible, but at the same time, we don't want to yeah. sacrifice. The complexity exactly. that language inherently possesses, right? So, and 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 of course, I I mean, probably in the presentation, I I have to oversimplify because there is, you can imagine. That's why I put the icon there with the with the video camera. I mean, you can't imagine how many hours of you know. One thing is to record, but then you have to go home, listen, transcribe, because that's another thing. We don't have research assistants like in the United States, right? That can do, because you see that in the papers that are published, right? I mean, it's like, well, the research assistant, well, we do it ourselves, right? So um, we, I have to say that the whole group works very hard. And that's why we have so many publications, of course, right? But uh, but yeah, it's a lot, it's very time consuming. And it's, uh, but at the same time, it's very rewarding because you see that, you know, if those, if that type of, uh, of of um, methodology could be used, uh, there could be, uh, you know, the, the, the children could really benefit from it. But again, and of course, I want this to be very clear, I never blame the teachers, because I know, because I've, I have friends that are going to retire next year, but my friends in primary school and secondary school, they tell me that one of the reasons why they retire is because they are, over, I mean, they're just snowed under with uh, administrative work, right? And so, are you going to ask them to, 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 on top of that, read research articles? Give me a break, right? So. Gracias, Pilar. Thank you so bueno, much. A vosotros, muchas gracias. And now Pedro would like to say a few words. No, before... just to thank you, uh, Pilar and Julio. It was a wonderful talk. That uh, shows very clearly how uh, interesting and complex at the same time is the topic of bilingualism and how to learn a new language, how to to improve the, the, the methodology. And uh, yeah, and I know, we know that for uh, for researchers like you, it, it's not an easy task to, to try to, to share or to, to explain uh, those complex uh, ideas and topics to the general public. But that's, this is the aim of this series, to try to share mm -hmm. knowledge from the academia with the general public. So thank you, muchísimas gracias. Y ha sido un honor y un gran placer para, para todos nosotros. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas, muchísimas gracias a vosotros por invitarme. Y pues eso, que quede claro que, que cualquiera, ponéis mi nombre en internet, aparece mi, mi, mi página web y ahí está toda la información. Y por supuesto me podéis escribir cuando queráis. ¿vale? O sea que gracias, gracias, gracias de nuevo.